Induction, induction, induction. Induction, induction. Induction, induction. Induction, induction. Induction, induction. Did you just say? All right, final part. You know where this is going, so strap in for the final segment of Ken Wheeler's lectures on magnetism. The universe or Mother Nature is far, far simpler than the idiots of quantum and modern science paint a picture of. All is force and motion, inertia and acceleration. All field modalities and interactions can be reduced to simply capacitance, resistance, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity, and subliminally so to ether hysteresis. Ether hysteresis. Okay, what he means with ether hysteresis is actually called the blister effect. And this is the effect that when you have two objects being lit up by a light, which is not a point source, the shadows they cast appear to blister as they get close together, as shown in this animation. I think that this is a fun one, and I won't really give Ken shit for not looking into this that much. Mainly because I made an assumption as to what the cause is for this effect, and then spent an embarrassing amount of time trying to code the animation to explain it, only to find out that I was completely wrong. But that's science for you. If your intuition tells you that this blister effect is due to overlapping penumbrae of the shadows, then just like mine, your intuition is wrong. So let's take an image of a shadow cast by a single object, and we can see the umbra, penumbra, and the antumbra. We will now introduce a second object. Note that the shadows have changed a bit. This is a ray tracing simulation, not a simple diagram. And we will label this ray as A. And we will now move the blue object towards the red object. And from this, we see that it is not the penumbras overlapping, but the umbra of one object actually growing as that ray is blocked by the other. Once again, no need for a mythical ether. It is just simple ray tracing. Magnetism is nothing more than the multiplicative field phenomena as witnessed by a point source field incommensurability that defines the perfect magnetodielectric geometry that fascinates mankind about magnets. The very same principle of point source luminal emissions from the lasers versus normal incoherent light are no different than the magnetism that people, in, people incorrectly think defines a magnet. We stupidly speak about diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, but the universe's most diamagnetic element, bismuth, accelerates towards the center of a large neodymium magnet. As you are repeating yourself, I will just repeat myself. What? Like it does here. All elements are fundamentally both diamagnetic, mostly so, and magnetic by dynamic nature of their elements. As already said, everything is capacitance, resistance, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity. Uh, Dollard, there you go. Dollard, in quoting J.J. Thompson in Heaviside, said that Thompson thought that magnetism was circling around the dielectric and it was ultimately a chicken or egg scenario that's never been resolved. But in fact, magnetism is merely the expression of the dielectric field and losing potential 
which manifests expanding, expanding divergent centrifugal force vectors that in turn manifest both topos, i.e. space, and the measure of space, which is time. Geomagnetic precession is the very reason that temporal phase exists at all. If you want a perfect chicken or egg analogy humorously, the dielectric would be a chicken sitting uh, on its eggs in the coop, and magnetism would be the same chicken running around the coop. <laughs> Again, there is only one field. The unintelligent humanity has always sought to pigeonhole things again as being different from one another based upon merely attributional variances is, of course, the reason why we have so much confusion. Here we'd actually see a, a, a vectorized version of either pole of a magnet once again. This is going to be interesting. Here we actually have true uh, magnetism at the edge. We have uh, centrifugal force in motion. And we have intermediate zones and the pressure mediation between the conjugate magnetodielectric, and we have the inverse of that, increasing inertia and acceleration. So the magnetism is flowing the one way, but it's not flowing, and it's not lines either. There's no such thing as lines of force. This is an absurd BS, as I told you a few chapters ago that came from Faraday. We actually have the conjugate interplay between the magnetodielectric of this uh, loss of inertia, which is, follows the rate of 1 over the phi to the power of negative 3, the expression native attribute of the dielectric or the ether itself, and the interplay of this geometry, which is necessitated, the expanding and contracting circles of the force in motion and the increasing inertia and acceleration between these two and the mediation on either pole of any magnet, we actually have this geometry. No. Once again, that is a skirmion. A skirmion is something that is called a topological defect in the magnetization, and it is a very interesting texture which is subject to a lot of research, to the extent that conferences on magnetism will have entire sections dedicated to skirmions. Skirmions are something called quasi-particles. They aren't real, proper particles, but they do behave like particles. On the outer edge, we see the magnetization pointing up, and in the middle, the magnetization points down, and there's a gradual transition as you approach the center. And this is called a nail skirmion, or a hedgehog skirmion. Then there is this one, which is called a block skirmion, or a spiral skirmion. But if we think back to lecture two, he says this. See, here's an insane definition from uh, Tom's, uh, to uh, Tony Skirme. And uh, this is another particle fantasy to define magnetism. Such skirmions are quasi-particles. They do not exist in the absence of a magnetic field. So here's another unicorn particle. Once again, this is not part of any experimental input or output. It's just, it is literally a brain fart like unicorns or leprechauns. What is also funny is where he got this image from. At the time of him making this, this image could have come from one of three locations. Firstly, the Horizon 2020 page about the Magnetic Skirmion for Future Nanospintronic Devices Project at CNRS, aka Magic Sky. Secondly, a phys.org page entitled Meet the Skirmions, Exotic Quasi-Particles Could Revolutionize Computing, or the Magic Sky Project website itself. Skirmions are interesting though. In magnetism, there are currently two very hot topics, artificial spin isomagnetic racetrack memory devices. In magnetic racetrack memory, the idea is to build a series of nanowires made of ferromagnetic materials. Magnetic domains, which according to Ken, don't exist, they form along the wire and the magnetization can either point along one direction of the wire or the other, and this can correspond to a one or a zero. By passing a spin-polarized current down the wire, we can make the domains move along the wire, and by passing a spin-polarized current perpendicular to the wire, we can switch the direction of the domain. Now, all you then need is a detector to measure the state of the magnetic domain to read the data stored. One of the current problems is the speed at which these domains can move down the wire. The speed is proportional to the current, but after a certain point, the walls between the domains break down. Enter the skirmion. Skirmions are much smaller and can bunch up much closer to each other, which means that they have to travel down the wire a lot less. And as long as our detector can detect the presence of a skirmion, then we are good. But it is very early days and there are still many problems. Magnetic skirmions are still not very well understood, and there are more potential avenues to explore for the construction of magnetic racetrack memory. And we are working hard on this. But anyway, Let's get back to Ken's presentation. This is what you don't see in small magnets, but... Uh... 
oh no, you only see these textures in small magnets. That structure has a diameter of about 50 nanometers. If it gets much larger, it becomes energetically unfavorable and the structure is unstable. Like, you know, the most diamagnetic element in the universe, bismuth will accelerate towards the center of a magnet. It is repelled away from the centrifugal edge, but it is actually attracted towards the uh, center. People don't understand that, nor have they actually even experienced or, you know, tried to test stuff like that because it requires a large magnet to do it. Um. <laughs> Here we see the same thing in just uh, different uh, symbolism, different little arrows of the centrifugal divergence. This is only true magnetism here if we're looking at a, quote, pole of a magnet here. The only true magnetism is right here. And uh, this, of course, is also flux, extremely high, intermediate, and extremely high. But this is true magnetism. This is not. This is wholly different. This is wholly different than this is. There's not a single textbook on magnetism out there that you'll read about this fact. Now, the reason why there are no textbooks where you can read this is because it's bollocks. And that is just the image used in an article called What are Skirmions? In the center, the magnetization points down, at the edge it points up. Each arrow represents the arithmetic mean of the spins in a small volume. But why am I arguing this point? That is not the pole of a magnet. It is a skirmion. Um, I grew up with liquid nitrogen doers and playing with yttrium barium copper oxide superconductors and always knew this was nonsense, but didn't know why. There's not superconducting of anything. When chilled to liquid nitrogen temperatures or LN2, these ceramic composites, in the case of the yttrium barium oxide, attain to nearly zero magnetic permeability and a strong magnetic field floats on top of these ceramics. What we actually call superconductivity is actually absolute bullshit. What happens is, is that the uh, ceramic composites become basically magnetically bulletproof. And this is the reason why uh, magnets will float on top of them when the ceramics are chilled to LN2 temperatures. is because the magnetic permeability shrinks to nearly nothing, and they literally become bulletproof to magnetic fields. Okay, magnetic permeability. This is a measure of a material's response to an applied magnetic field. When you apply an external field, H, there is the field inside the material, B. The magnetic permeability of the material is given by the ratio of the B field and the applied H field. The absolute permeability of a material is often expressed in terms of the permeability of a vacuum multiplied by some factor called the relative permeability. Then we also have the magnetic susceptibility, which indicates how the magnetization of the material responds to the applied field. The magnetic susceptibility is given by the relative permeability minus one, and the magnetization of a material responds to the applied field according to this expression. We can characterize materials in terms of these values. First, we have paramagnetic materials. The relative permeability for paramagnetic materials is greater than one, which means that the susceptibility is greater than zero. So the magnetization of a material will align with the applied field. We also have diamagnetic materials, which have a relative permeability less than one, and the susceptibility is then less than zero. Because of that, the magnetization tries to oppose the applied field. When it comes to ferromagnets, the susceptibility is not constant, and the relationship is a bit more complicated. We previously stated that the relationship between the applied and the induced field is given by the expression where B is equal to mu naught times mu R times H, but for ferromagnetic materials, mu R is a function of B, which leads to a horrible equation. But it also leads to hysteresis, which is useful in lots of different applications, and it allows us to make things like permanent magnets. The reason behind this odd dependence is due to magnetic domains, which I have explained several times now, so I won't go into it. But finally, we have superconductors, which indeed have a relative permeability of exactly zero, and this means that the susceptibility is exactly minus one, and the magnetization of the material exactly opposes the applied magnetic field. Now, this bit is interesting as the susceptibility and permeability are bulk properties. In paramagnetic, diamagnetic and ferromagnetic materials, this is all due to how these spins inside the material align with the field. 
superconductors achieve the effect through a different mechanism. When you have a superconductor and you bring a magnetic field in, current loops inside the material are induced. But as a superconductor has zero resistance, these current loops don't really die off and they can reach pretty high currents. And these current loops create magnetic fields of themselves and these fields oppose the applied magnetic field. The field inside the superconductor is then cancelled out. But outside of the superconductor, you do find a field. When added to the applied field, you get field lines that kind of look like this. And this seems a bit reminiscent of water flowing past a rock, or at least if you ignore turbulent flow. And so to say, using a loose uh, analogy there. So-called magnetic attraction is the exact opposite of magnetism. It's a dielectric acceleration towards increasing inertia or potential along the plane of inertia whose nexus is counter space. Kent must have a different definition for potential because mechanics tells us that you can also just treat forces as stuff moving from high potential to low potential. Or ether stasis, so-called magnetic repulsion is magnetism being multiplied uh, through external applied additional forces. These applied compressions are two increasing magnetotoroidal field pressures. Let's go on to this. Let's take a really long time to explain. This is how simple uh, space and time is. We have an accumulation and... Uh... Seriously, this guy claims to be an expert in photography. The only difference between this and a bad flat earth video is that the camera is on a stand and he has a decent microphone. But strip that away and all you have is another asshole just filming his computer screen. Force and motion, inertia and acceleration interplaying between each other. This is, of course, the ring magnet again underneath the supercell. Looking at a ring magnet through the supercell, we have the exact same pattern in the central void as we do uh, on a cube of any other magnet. This field geometry is not in or of the magnet, but of the field or the medium, the ether itself. A ring magnet is only special because its physical shape is the exact same geometric shape as the magnetism itself, that being a torus. Since magnetism is a dielectric field and all things begin and terminate in counter space, this defines that all phenomena are actually untruth from a metaphysical standpoint and that counter space shouldn't be called counter space. Rather, ultimate reality. So, counter space is ultimate reality. Tell me, how are you going to test this? Do you have a description of ultimate reality that you can test against experiment? Um, it's another diagram. It actually take a long time to explain. Simplex nature of mother nature. Sometimes these uh, diagrams like to flip really quickly. There we go. Charge, discharge, space and counter space, convergent, divergent, centrifugal, centripetal, and we have ether modalities that are either radial, spatial, circular, or counter spatial. It's really as simple as this. It's actually even more simple than this. You know, uh, only humanity has tried to complicate Mother Nature. Mother Nature, now, I'm not against math at all, but Mother Nature does not use a calculator. Everything is a pressure mediation. Everything is either force in motion or inertia and acceleration. Charge or discharge. I mean, Mother Nature and uh, her uh, cosmic mechanics are actually extremely simple. You have nothing against math. Well, may I suggest you start using some? You see, if you have a theory, you must be able to test it and compare it against experiment. For that, you need to measure things or quantify things. And this is the only way that you can compare your predictions against observation and develop some confidence in your theory. I think I've shown you this before. Actually, I have not. This is a projection on the wall. I actually use a VCR to record this a spiral and this crosshatch pattern. And I fed it into a large uh, tube TV set, which is nothing other than a di dielectric discharge device. And you notice when I actually apply a magnetic field to this crosshatch with a one side of a magnet, I'll end up with a, a clockwise spiral. And if I flip it over, I'll end up with a counterclockwise spiral. Well, isn't that interesting? Oh, yay, you have discovered the Lorentz force. Well done. Uh, same tube TV setting, you can see the plane of inertia, centrifugal divergence, uh, centripetal hyperboloid. And uh, here I have it without the lines. Here we see the torus here. Here we see the, the uh, conjugate magnetodielectric or this interplay, this uh, superimposition of the torus and the hyperboloid. Just using a simple dielectric discharge device, which is all a tube TV set is. By using the same spiral as visioned here, this spiral here, which is clockwise, and we go down here. If I apply one clockwise size of the magnet, side of the magnet, it will spin the clockwise uh, spiral even more so. 
But if I use the inverse, and you notice the centripetal point here where there is light, is uh, counterclockwise. The centripetal point is always inverse to the centrifugal. Proof of this is right here. Anybody could test that themselves. But using the same clockwise spiral, if I apply the, apply the different side of the magnet, instead of turning the, uh, the spiral more so uh, clockwise, it will actually pull it in on itself and create this form. But this is the exact same. When we're looking at this here, and when we're looking at this here, we're looking at the exact same projection being twisted by inverse vortices, inverse vortices from one side of the magnet to the other. And you will also notice, too, if we only look at the center, we have a clockwise light vortex here. But on the other side, we have a counterclockwise light vortex here. Undeniable. Okay, let's go through this. First, we take the Lorentz force law where Q is the charge of the particle, E is the electric field vector, V is the velocity of the charged particle, and B is the magnetic field vector, where the cross indicates the vector product. We will ignore the electric field and just write this. To make it simple, we will just consider the right-hand rule. If you extend your index finger along the velocity vector and your middle finger along the magnetic field vector, and when you extend your thumb, you get the direction of the force. Now we take this diagram of a CRT monitor. I have outlined the tube in black and drawn some green glyphs to indicate the magnetic field due to the magnet being held to the screen. I will now start firing electrons through the tube, although it is worth pointing out that I've only set up some force field which will move the electrons from left to right on the screen to get the simulation to run and a magnetic field due to the magnet held to the screen. So in essence, I am only showing how the magnet at the screen perturbs the system as the fields inside the monitor are a bit more complex. On the top left panel, I have a cross section of the CRT in the XY plane. Top right shows the XZ plane. You'll notice that the magnet is slightly off and this is to disrupt symmetry. The origin of the electrons follow a very narrow normal distribution in the Y and Z coordinates and the same for the initial velocities. These are just small variations I introduced to make sure that you see a bit more of what is happening with such few particles. The Y and Z coordinates of the electrons is shown on the left and the image on the right is a scatter plot of the Y and Z coordinates of the particles at the grey line indicated on the other plots. So if we scan through the X coordinates we clearly see that the paths are spiraling counterclockwise. We can flip the orientation of the magnet and the paths spiral clockwise. We can also position the magnet elsewhere and you can see the electrons flying way off screen. Now this isn't the most robust simulation, but you can kind of see what's going on here. And none of this is new. This was discovered centuries ago, and the formulation that I've shown on screen was actually developed by none other than Ken's hero, Oliver Heaviside. Here's one last image I want to show to you. I don't want to be the last image. I want you to look at this really closely and realize something here. When the ferrofluid and the surfactant used in the magnetic polarity, we actually have uh, the central part. Just thinking about the very, very central part of centripetal convergence, we always have this black hole because this is representational. Wherever we see light, we are seeing magnetism. And of course, since the center part of any magnet is the dielectric, this is why we see nothing represented here. But if we use a dielectric discharge device like a huge tube TV set, which is the inverse image of a uh, supercell or ferrocell. Instead of seeing a black spot, we'll see a bright white spot, which we have here. Note the bright spot on the CRT screen is because of that cross product. At these points, the magnetic field and the velocity vectors are anti-parallel, and this means that the cross product of the two is zero, and the only force then acting on it is due to the electric field, and this force is perpendicular to the screen. But the magnetism is represented in black. You see, we have two different representations. Wherever we see light, we see magnetism. Wherever we see dielectric, we see black. The inverse here on the tube TV set, wherever we see black, we have magnetic. Wherever we see light, we have the dielectric. Proof positive better there does not exist. Let me repeat that. Proof positive better example does not exist. But Ken, they don't look anything alike. On the screen, you have a bright spot in the middle, then a dark ring. Outside of that dark ring, you have a continuous, albeit distorted, image. On the ferrocell, you have a dark spot in the middle, then a bright ring. Okay, cool, I'm with you so far, but then you have a scattering pattern outside and not a continuous image. Um, 
the actual uh, nanoparticles of iron and the oleic acid surfactant that actually make up uh, the uh, ferrofluid will only coalesce and manifest light at the lines of the magnetic. And of course, there are no lines, as I told you. This is just the interplay between the magnetic and the dielectric. But this is actually a very important diagram. This is the end of section six and the finale of the uh, lecture on magnetism. I hope you like this six-part series. If you do, please click the link below. Any small donation is greatly welcomed, and I certainly take questions. There's only so much you could fit into a tight little lecture. Obviously, much greater expansion and elaboration requires a big old book, which I am the author thereof. So uh, if you like these, I start to take Bitcoin now. I put a Bitcoin address below. Any little thing helps if you're so, if you're so inclined. Uh, do svidania, uvidim se paka. And uh, thank you so much for watching. watching. Um, Lux Everitas. Bye. Wait, hold on, Ken. Where are you going? Was that it? I thought that you were going to define magnetism. All right, I'll do it then. And I would like to highlight that Ken has created two hours of content in which he claims to define magnetism. No, to define, not describe or explain the fundamental ideas and the emergent phenomena, just define. And I will have a crack at it now. Magnetism is the field of study pertaining to a series of effects attributed to one aspect of the electromagnetic force, particularly the effects due to the quantum mechanical property called spin and the interaction between objects due to this property. You see, magnetism isn't just one thing or a single phenomenon, it's an entire field of study. Ken, at best, attempts to define magnetism as phi, and this has units of Weber's, but within magnetism, this is a quantity known as magnetic flux. What about spin, induction, or moment? They are all key concepts in magnetism, and they are being completely ignored by Ken. This definition would be the equivalent of defining a car as a metal plate that makes it go fast when you press on it. All you have done, then, is define the accelerator pedal. But here comes the issue of what a definition actually is in science. In science, a definition is just a useful statement that is communicated so everyone has a basis from which to work. For example, momentum. It is just defined as the product of mass and velocity. Force is defined as a change in momentum. None of these definitions care about what these phenomena actually are. But as long as everyone agrees on a definition, we can work with them and communicate our work with a shared understanding. Ken fails to understand that the whole body of science is an abstraction. His dissatisfaction with the definition of a field is rooted in his inability to grasp that the whole concept of a field is abstract. Now, what is a field? Well, it is just a quantity that can be represented with a tensor over all space. Ultimately, we cannot know what that quantity truly is because we cannot know what reality is. But we can quantify it and therefore describe how that quantity affects stuff and how stuff affects that quantity. But that was it for this. I have to say that I'm glad that this is over. Ken paints himself as an expert in languages, philosophy, magnetism, photography, and many other things. Aside from the photography, I'm pretty sure that I've demonstrated that he hasn't got a fucking clue when it comes to these subjects. Although many people in my comments section will tell you that he is pretty useless on the photography stuff as well. Make no mistake, Ken is a grifter, and I would encourage everyone who thinks that Ken is onto something to really really critically evaluate what he is saying and look up how other well-known grifters operate. You'll find some fun similarities. But with that, thank you all for watching and going on this journey with me. I will keep half an eye out on this channel to see if there's any fun nonsense that pops up. I would also like to thank my patrons who have been a huge help in running this channel and help me do my thing in this series. In contrast to Ken, I won't tell you that I live tight and that I'm poor and your donations are greatly appreciated and it will help me eat otherwise i'll starve because unlike ken i'm not going to lie about that sort of thing but if you do want to support this channel it will still be appreciated very much and i'm pretty sure that you will be able to find all the links but thank you very much and until next time induction 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 Ball Induction Sphere Induction Ball Sphere Ball Induction Sphere Induction Ball Sphere Ball Induction Sphere Induction Ball Sphere Ball Induction Ball Induction Sphere Clear Clear Clear
The fuck did you just say? Induction sphere. Induction